tonight's webinar. Tonight's webinar is National Children's Dental Health Month. My name is Sarah Miller with Child Care Aware of America. And I just wanted to touch on a few things before we kick off tonight's webinar. If you have any questions throughout tonight's presentation, there is a question box on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to type questions in there as we go on, and we'll try and get to all of the questions at the end. If we don't have time to address all of the questions, we'll be sure to follow up with you via email. Tonight's webinar will also be recorded and posted on our website, and I can send out a link to the recording tomorrow so you all can access it at a later time. Also, if you are interested in certificates, just remember you need to watch tonight's webinar live, and I will provide my email address at the end of the webinar to contact me for the certificate. Tonight's webinar is going to be presented by Deidre Callanan, and she is the Director of Oral Health Programs at the Colorado Association for School-Based Healthcare. And now I'm going to hand it over to her. Thanks, Sarah. So I just wanted to give a little bit more about my background. So I've been in oral health for over 20 years. I've worked with the Head Start Associations in Connecticut, uh, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts, as well as School-Based Health Centers. So while February is Children's Oral Health Month, and really Children's Oral Health is important year-round, having this particular month helps share information and tips and has a focus for education. So that's why it's really important that we make it a point to do something during February that has to do with oral health. So why is oral health important? Um, it's for a lot of reasons. I'll go over a lot of the reasons today and probably give you a little bit more information about oral health than you ever wanted to know, but also give you information on why it's important, how cavities are formed, and how to prevent them as well as tips and resources. A lot of inequity. Deidre? Yeah? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it looks like we can't see your screen right now. Oh, no. How's that? Much better. <laughs> Thank Did you. <laughs> Let me see. That looks great. Okay, good. Let me see. I can't seem to advance now. Yeah. How's that? Nope, still I can't advance, Sarah. Um, maybe if you just view it as the slideshow, it should go ahead and go through the slides. Yeah, it, oh, here we go. All right, here we go. Let me go back. Okay, so here's where I kind of stop. So oral health, there's a lot of inequalities, and really, 25% of children experience 80% of the decay, with most of the vulnerable children being of low income, members of minority groups, and children with disabilities and uh, complex health conditions. So we used to think, well, we've been after working with tooth decay and dental disease for a long time, so isn't it a thing of the past? And it really isn't. In fact, it's called a silent epidemic. Disease rates are actually increasing, and tooth decay is causing a lot of unnecessary pain that they're having. Kids are being distracted by pain. They're losing time from school. Their nutrition suffers, and these complications can last into teen years and then all the way through adulthood. You can't be healthy without a healthy mouth, and that's true. Health of your mouth is really important for overall health, and it's more than just a pretty smile. We can help our kids grow up without these dental problems. If you look at these two pictures on this slide, you'll notice the differences of a healthy mouth on the left. It's nice and clean. The teeth are glossy. The gums are pink and tight. And the unhealthy mouth on the right has several teeth with cavities. The gums are inflamed, and you can see a little bit of how the the inside of that pulp is coming through on that front tooth. One of the most important messages that we like to get across is that baby teeth are important. Oftentimes, we'll hear parents and child care providers say, 
they're just baby teeth and they're just going to fall out anyway. But the important thing is to know that we need our baby teeth. We need them for eating. When We need them for eating, so when teeth hurt or they have to be removed because of a cavity, they, we can't get good nutrition. You can't bite into a fresh, crunchy apple, so often the options are soft and sticky processed foods, usually filled with sugar. Another reason why baby teeth are important is for speaking. So try saying your S's without your front teeth while they're gone, and you try to learn to, children try to learn to talk that way. It makes kids feel shy, and they might not want to participate in school. Another reason why baby teeth are important is for growing and development. The baby teeth are needed for the jaw and the face to grow and change. It changes all throughout childhood and really well into the teen years. And it depends on those teeth to hold shape. Holding space. Permanent teeth need the room to grow in. So when there isn't any space for them to, to move and come in, then other teeth will next door might shift or go out of place. Baby teeth help keep a healthy place for the entire mouth. I like to ask parents, when is the last baby tooth lost? And it's age 12 or 13 years. So that's a long time for those baby teeth to be in the mouth. There's a lot of new dental science, but it's easy to understand when people know the why. When they're, then they're more likely to do the things that make a difference. So this information is true whether we're talking about babies, teens, or grandparents. Dental disease is progressive. It starts out small, but it gets worse. And it doesn't just go away. But the good news is that dental disease is reversible in the early stages. Our goal is to present it and catch it early, because early decay can be stopped and reversed. We want kids to get to the dentist while they're in the first stage. The wait and see attitude is not good advice for teeth. This picture shows the early stages of decay. You can see the arrows I have pointing to some white chalky areas near the gum line. This is the beginning of tooth decay. This can be reversed or healed at this point if we can get fluoride on it and if the conditions of the mouth are changed by brushing and watching what we eat. But if nothing's done, it'll continue. The white spots lead to decay. Small decay leads to serious decay. These, uh, this, these show to show that, photos show that changes happen quickly. These three different children, pictures of different children, show how quickly those baby teeth can come, become diseased. Remember, those upper front teeth come into the mouth when the child is about 8 to 12 months. So they were decayed in just a few months. This probably happened because a child sleeps with a bottle filled with milk, formula, juice, soda, anything really sugary. The official term is early childhood caries, but some people call it baby bottle mouth or baby bottle tooth decay. Early childhood cavities, on, these, on this slide here, you can see both white spots and brown spots on the same teeth. The white spots have progressed to brown spots or holes or cavities. So at this point, the child's probably having some pain and, actually, and breathing in any kind of cold air drinking anything cold or hot is really going to hurt. This slide is showing the top teeth of the mouth. And notice how close these teeth are together. Food easily gets stuck, and it's hard to clean with a toothbrush. So the rule to follow is begin flossing when the teeth touch. Flossing is something parents can do at home. Kids can't do it themselves for a long time. They have to have that manual dexterity. This child probably has some pain with eating or drinking, and she may not want anyone to touch her teeth. And just because a child doesn't want to eat or brush their teeth doesn't mean that they're being naughty or they need discipline, but they actually may be in pain. So this is untreated decay and abscess. 
The decay is so extensive that most of the teeth are destroyed. And then when the decay reaches the center of the tooth, infections or abscesses are common. So you can see the enlarged circular area on the upper right of the photo. That's where an abscess is formed. Abscesses are serious conditions and should be treated within 24 hours. Treatment for something like this might include draining the abscess and then prescribing some antibiotics for the infection. We encourage kids and parents not to press on that sore spot. If it's left untreated, serious complications can occur, like this. This is some facial swelling from the abscess. This abscess hasn't been treated. His face is swollen in response to the infection, and the area of the eye is red and swollen. The infection will continue to spread unless the treatment is started immediately the same day, preferably. Children and adults can become so sick that they can die from this type of infection. But prevention is possible, and there's a lot of things that we can do to prevent these problems. A simple and surprisingly effective thing to do is to keep your teeth and mouth clean. So I want to go into just explaining a little bit of the basics of how germs cause cavities. Um, we can start with the easy stuff. What is a cavity? Well, we know that it's a result of decay. The decay can affect the outer part of the tooth and the inner part of the tooth. Decay is caused by a bacteria called strep mutans, and it can occur at any age. Bacteria are transmitted to babies and just to anybody um, through objects or sharing of objects. If a baby drops a pacifier, mom picks it up, wipes it off, puts it in her own mouth to clean it, and passes it along to the baby while she's also passing along the germs. Same thing if she tests the baby's food on the spoon. Germs are being passed on, and they're just spread through any everyday objects, just like a cold germ or a blue germ. You don't want to share toothbrushes or, or sippy cups. Bacteria are transmitted to babies. So let me go back one more. For the germs to take over and do their body dirty work, they need to be fed. So they like sugary foods like candy and cake and soda. But we also know that more about germs. We know that they like foods that are easily broken down, like refined carbohydrates. So that means foods like white flour and, and, and sugar, pretzels, crackers, white bread, chips, foods we think is starchy. These foods are easily available for the germs. We have the germs, the germs have the food, and they instantly produce acid that weakens the tooth. And that acid is called that 20 minute acid attack. Acid stays on our teeth for 20 minutes every time we eat or drink. When the teeth are exposed to acid over and over again, the teeth are weakened and eventually decay. So we need to look at what we eat but we also need to look at when we eat. One of the most important things to do is to clean away the germs. And we can do that through brushing and flossing. Brush after breakfast and before bed. And the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry has uh, suggested that children have a caregiver or a parent brush their teeth until the age of six or seven, until when they can write in cursive. And that's when they have the dexterity to actually brush their teeth. Otherwise, they could just be eating a toothpaste or sucking on a toothbrush. Flossing is, again, rule of thumb, floss for your child until they have the dexterity, but when the teeth start to touch. First tooth, first toothbrush. As soon as the first tooth comes in, use a gauze or a soft baby toothbrush after feeding. Just do round, gentle scrubs. These three photos are showing different ways to kind of hold on to the child, the baby, when uh, you're brushing their teeth. So you want to gently stabilize the baby's head. Lift or lightly press the lips away from the teeth, and then just use a small, soft brush twice a day. So we got to watch the sugar and the white flour. 
Germs eat the sugar and create the acid that causes decay, so decreasing that sugar are going to help decrease the cavity. So I want to talk a little bit about food labels here. Many of the oral health messages match what we already know and teach about nutrition and diabetes and childhood obesity. We know that sugar isn't the only food that causes cavities, but we know that if we can cut down on the sugar we feed kids, the healthier they will be. So getting into the habit of looking at how much sugar gets people into the habit of looking where sugar is often hiding. So I put up a label there just for an example. This is a bottle of chocolate milk, it's 16 ounces, and the label says that there are 28 grams of sugar in one serving. So what exactly is a gram? Four grams equal one teaspoon. So a gram is a quarter of a teaspoon of sugar. So if I divide 28 grams by four, I learn that there's seven teaspoons of sugar. But it's per there's two servings in here in this milk. So actually, there's 14 teaspoons of sugar into that, in that chocolate milk. We also have to remember that milk also has other nutrients like protein in it, but we want you just to be aware of the hidden sugar that is in uh, the things we drink especially. This is an advertisement that we, that I really like. So it says, you wouldn't drink 22 packs of, you wouldn't eat 22 packs of sugar, then why are you drinking them? Here's another slide of the amount of sugar in soda, in a Coke. And you can see, of course, the larger the Coke, the more sugar that is. This is a really great resource, this sugarstacks.com. You can check a lot of the sugar content of different foods. There's Pop-Tarts and cereals and donuts, and it kind of gives you a range of how much sugar um, is in what you're um, eating and drinking. So that's a really good resource, resource sugarstacks.com. Oral health and overall health. So we know that poor nutrition and poor overall health, oral health are related to other medical problems like obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. And childhood is actually the perfect time to teach good habits for a lifetime of good health. So it's important to reach those kids now and get them used to going to the dentist and getting them used to taking care of their teeth. So we talked about how the germs create the acid that cause decay. I want to talk a little bit more about that acid attack. So rest and repair. So besides cutting down on the acid attack, there's another reason to limit frequent eating. Between eating, our teeth need to have time to rest and rebuild. The official term is remineralize. That means that if we can have clean teeth that are not bathed in acid, our teeth have a chance to rebuild. So just like baby drool, saliva is good for the teeth and we need to give it a chance to do its job. Here we have an acid attack for 20 minutes after each meal with time to rest in between. So you can see at breakfast, it spikes up, the acid does in the saliva, it spikes up and it stays that way for 20 minutes, and then it starts to come down after 20 minutes, giving the teeth time to rest and rebuild, and it stays down, the acid level stays down for a long time until the child eats lunch. So once the child eats lunch, or we eat lunch, it spikes up again, but after 20 minutes, it stops, and there's a period of remineralization, the same thing with dinner. So very much in between Areas of peaked acids are areas of rest and remineralization, so that's important. This slide is acid attack after acid attack with no time to rest and rebuild. So here you can see the child has breakfast in the morning, that's what the M stands for, a meal, and the acid attack increases. Then shortly after that, after the acid level gets to dip down, the child has a snack and that increases it up again for 20 minutes. And that gets repeated all throughout the day with constant eating and drinking. So that's what we want to remember that when you have, um, think of like a big gulp, 
if you're having that and you're sipping on that all throughout the day, that increases the acid attack. And if you're having a meal, be sure to have your dessert kind of at the same time as the meal instead of um, waiting until later for that treat because that way that decreases the number of acid attacks. So we know that families need to find a dental home and we need to encourage them to be at the dentist before the child has any severe problems. And there's a lot of places you can go for dental care besides the traditional dental office. There's a lot of medical providers who are starting to do um, oral health screening in the pediatric offices and they're starting to do fluoride treatments in the pediatric offices. But there's also community centers, there's mobile clinics, and there's school-linked programs. I want to talk a little bit about pregnancy and with infants specifically. So it used, it used to be that people thought it wasn't safe to have any kind of dental treatment during the pregnancy, but it certainly is. Just be sure to tell your dentist or your hygienist that you're pregnant. And if you need x-rays, they'll cover your body with a lead apron to protect you and the baby so it's completely safe. One of the most important things that you can do while you're pregnant is to keep your health mouth, your mouth healthy so you won't pass those cavities causing germs onto your baby. So if you, need, if you have active cavities in your mouth, get those filled. Get your gums as healthy as you possibly can. During pregnancy, there's an increase of hormones, so often gums will bleed more and be a little more swollen, so you want to make sure that you're keeping your hygiene, your gums, and your teeth as healthy as possible during that time. Even oral health should be started even before the teeth come in. So you, for infants' gums, you can use a dampen soft cloth or gauze, just to make sure it's clean, and then just wipe in between feedings, just kind of keeping that, that sugar level down. So when does the first tooth come in? Well, there's a variety that you can just, just depends between children, but usually six to ten months is when the first tooth comes in. So remember earlier we talked about the last baby, that's baby tooth leaves the mouth, usually around 12 or 13. So that's a long time for that tooth has to be in the mouth. So keeping it healthy is really important. So teething. Symptoms are fussiness and drooling. And we want to make sure that you're, you want to avoid the teething biscuits because they're full of sugar. And we want to have the baby maybe chew on a cold ring or a wet cloth. Teething doesn't cause fever or ear infection or diarrhea. It doesn't. Those are caused by bacteria and viruses. Um, but it, the symptoms of fussiness and drooling are definitely symptoms of teething. This picture shows an eruption hematoma, which is, can be completely normal, but I wanted to show you this in case you see this because it looks really scary and I'm sure it doesn't feel very good either. But that's completely in, common site that we see that um, we just leave it alone and let the tooth come in naturally. We recommend the first visit by the first birthday or within six months after the first tooth erupts. If we wait until age three or five, de the decay could already be severe. We, the first visit is a quick look. It doesn't take long at all for the dentist or the hygienist or the medical doctor to take a look. Um, it, it's a simple, simple procedure. Here is uh, just to show you how you can do a knee to knee exam. Some providers are doing this instead of having the little ones in the big chair that can be kind of scary. So it's also called the lap to lap. But you can see that the mom is holding the child's wiggly arms and legs. And this gives a chance to really connect with the provider to get some patient, to get some education about how to take care of your child's teeth. And to just do a check before problems can start. And you know, even if the child doesn't like it, or even if they cry, 
it's over pretty quickly. And I always tell dentists when a baby's crying, at least their mouth is open and you can see in. So fluoride varnish is one of the other preventative measures that we can take along with brushing and flossing and going to the dentist early. These slides show um, some yellowish substances being, being brushed on the teeth. So the fluoride varnish can be done by a, de a dentist, a hygienist, or a pediatrician. And it gives a longer lasting protection than, than fluoride in the toothpaste because it stays on the teeth longer. And it can stop early cavities from getting larger and even heal the white spots. The varnish is painted on the teeth and allowed to stay on overnight. Um, it may require more than one treatment. Some kids can get up to three visits, uh, fluoride treatments a year, and especially if they're high risk decay. But um, that's good. Keep them going into the dentist and he checks on everything. It's always a good thing. Down sealant are another preventative measure that we have. Sealants are usually placed on the biting surfaces of molar teeth. That's kind of, that's where the bumps and the grooves are on your back teeth, which is a perfect place for food to get stuck and cause decay. The sealant smooths out the grooves and prevents decay. You can see on the picture in set that the white area, that white plastic coating, so that's just sealed over those grooves. And it's a very easy and painless procedure. And you put it on the teeth, and they protect the tooth for years. But just on that biting surface, of course, you still have to brush and floss and watch what you eat. Lift the lip. So brushing every day gets parents into the habit of keeping the teeth clean. But we also recommend lifting the lip at least once a month. It's easy to do. You just lift or gently push the lip out of the way and take a peek at the teeth. You want to look for plaque collecting along the gum line. You want to look for white or brown spots or anything unusual. But be sure to look at the top and the bottom of the teeth. And you want to look behind at the back side of the teeth where the milk can pool and cause decay. Doing the lift the lip is one of the best ways to prevent childhood cavities. So prevention is possible. Um, we know that parents and child care providers are in an important position to teach really good habits, to educate the families, and to connect families to a dental home. And we have to remember that that professional care is integral into making sure that um, the kids get seen. Oftentimes we hear about parents who have, have their own fears in terms of going to the dentist, so they don't like to go. Maybe they've had a bad experience and they really don't want to take their child in. But it's important to teach the parents that since things have changed since they were little and maybe the cavity, filling the cavity is an easier process, but if you can be preventative, then we're going to Never, we're not going to have any kind of fear for that child. It's going to be a regular thing that we do every six months. Occasionally, you have, might have a cavity that needs to be filled, but it's a regular part of what we do. We go to the dentist every six months. So in a nutshell, we want to make sure the parents should be on top of their own dental care, because remember, germs are transmissible. We want to make sure we visit the dentist by the age of one, or within six months of getting the first tooth. And we want to make sure that we get routine care. We want to brush after breakfast and before bed. But I also want to add in here about a word about medications. And so a lot of medications have flavorings incorporated into them now, and those are sugars. And so a parent could be doing all the best things in terms of watching the sugar intake, taking the child to the dentist, brushing the teeth in the morning and at night, and then after they brush their teeth at night, give them their medication and they just undid all the good that they did all day. So medication and then brush and then bed. Um, medicines like inhalers um, can cause a decrease in saliva, and so that's, that's what cavities love. They, they want no saliva and lots of sugar, so just be aware of that and then decreasing your sugar amounts. 
I have some resources listed here. The Academy of General Dentistry has information for parents and child care providers. They are, uh, you can just look under there for the public tab. The National Maternal and Child Oral Health Research Center has an extensive resources for oral health, including for children, including children with special needs. And they have a lot of information, a lot of it's free, and they will either send it to you in bulk if you want to give it out to parents, or you can download them. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, again, great links for parents and help in finding on how to find a pediatric dentist and other health dental health resources links. Wow, we finished early. So, any questions? Okay, great. Well, we do have a few questions coming in here. So, I'll read the questions, and then if you could just help answer them, that would be great. Okay. Okay, let's see here. And the first question we have is, is there a toothpaste for children that helps with sensitivity? No, not that I'm aware of. There isn't. Well, sensitivity is not as common in children as it is in older people. Like as we get older, our gums kind of recede a little bit, so a little bit of the dentin is showing, and it makes teeth sensitive to cold and hot. But with kids, usually there isn't that sensitive problem, so we don't have toothpastes, toothpastes that have that type of ingredient in it. I would find out why the teeth are sensitive and what they're sensitive to. I would definitely get that checked out because it's kind of unusual. Okay, great. Um, there are a couple of questions uh, regarding the information that was in today's webinar, um, such as the sugar website and the uh, resources page. And I know that people are looking to get those resources. So what I can do is when we post tonight's recorded webinar on our website, I can include a link to the slides, which will include um, all of those websites. And they should be able to be hyperlinked so you can click them off of our website. Right. And that was sugarstack.com. That's a really fun website. You can put in, search what foods you want to find out the amount of sugar. It's a really great learning tool. Um, one of the questions we have here is, how often is it safe to have children get x-rays? Usually x-rays are if there's, an, if there's a problem. So uh, they usually will do it at checkup once a year, but it can be less than that too. So there isn't really any standard of care. You want to just make, that they, make sure that they are necessary to look for cavities. If a child is more cavity prone than another, then they're probably going to have more x-rays than the child who doesn't have as many cavities. So it kind of just depends on what the state of their mouth is and if they have are prone to a lot of cavities. So sometimes when we look at a tooth, it looks like it has a tiny little cavity. When we take an x-ray, it can be bigger inside the tooth and we're just not aware of it. Okay, great. Um, here's a question that says, my son is three years old and doesn't know how to gargle. Can I still use a fluoride paste? So, so I think you're talking about probably the fluoride that's in the toothpaste. And so a rule of thumb is to have the child just spit out. It's hard because they're so little they can't spit or gargle. So you want to use the tiniest amount of toothpaste. So with a three-year-old, you're using just a smear of toothpaste. You don't really need much for it. You want the fluoride toothpaste to get on the enamel to strengthen it, but you also don't want them swallowing a lot of it. So just a smear of toothpaste. You know that on the commercials you'll see a big ribbon of toothpaste. No one needs that much toothpaste. That's, they do that to sell their toothpaste. Even adults really a, a pea-sized amount is enough. And then it looks like there is something that's kind of a follow-up question to that. That it says, I was told by a pediatric dentist that there is no benefit to toddler toothpaste until they can spit it out. And do you agree with this? Yep, that's a really controversial. It depends. So when we're thinking about high-risk kids, ones that get a, have a lot of decay and get a lot of cavities, they're going to need more fluoride to offset that 
you know, there's the way of thinking that if you're in, if your child goes to the dentist all the time, and if you are keeping on top of things in terms of, you know, lifting the lip and you know, brushing for them and going in every six months, and you have the access to a dentist, then fluoride in your toothpaste may not be something that you want to do. But when we talk about fluoride in paste, it's primarily for kids who are at high risk. Great. Um, another question that we have here is, what is the proper way to brush? So you want to do it at a 45 degree angle, and you don't want to press hard. It doesn't take much pressure to get the plaque off of your teeth. And I know you guys can't see me, but I'm kind of like giving a hand signal here. But um, you want to just do light little circles and kind of like light little scrubs all around the teeth, around the front and around the back and along the biting surfaces. Use a really soft brush. And again, don't press hard. And that's the same thing with adults, too. Again, that the gum tissue around our teeth is so thin that if we are really scrubbing our teeth, that starts wearing away the gum tissue, and that can lead to sensitivity to colds. So you just want to do a little light scrub and, um, and the angle and getting the bristles in. But get every surface of the tooth, the front, the back, and the biting surface. Okay, great. Another question that we have here is, when should children switch from kids' toothpaste to adults? I would say in the teen, you know, adult toothpaste, well, I'll start with this. Kids' toothpaste usually is bubblegum flavor or cherry or like kid flavors. And so when usually about teen years, they start switching over to a mint seems to feel better. But, you know, I guess there are adults out there that like the bubblegum flavor, so you could keep doing that. The idea is not really the kind of toothpaste, but that you're just using a little bit and, and brushing the teeth. So I guess that's preference, really. Another question that we have is, do you have to wait a certain amount of time to brush teeth after a meal? No, you can do that anytime. There's no set time after. Another thing you can do when we talk about the acid attack, especially for adults, kids can't really do this. But if you're eating a high sugar dessert, let's say, and so we know that the acid attack has increased right then. So what you can do is take a swig of water and swish it around in your mouth. That water neutralizes out the acid. And so that stops the acid attack, too. Kids really can't do that swishing, but, but that's good for adults. But no, there's no timing in, in terms you can brush right after and stop the acid attack even sooner if you want. OK, it looks like we have a question back to the proper brushing. Um, uh -huh. Someone said that some of the children um, that she watches, they chew the brush, and she wants to know, should I be brushing for them as well after they finish? She brushes with them and continually shows them the technique, but should she brush after they chew on the brush? That's tough because I'm sure you don't have a lot of time to brush each child's teeth, and so ideally, yes, you could brush each child's teeth because they're not. You're right. They're chewing on it. They're um, sucking on the paint. They're not really, they don't have the dexterity to get in there and brush. So if you have the time to brush each child's teeth, that's wonderful. But most people don't. So hopefully, maybe you can make sure the parents are doing that at home so they can catch it. But um, yeah, that's a tough one. But you know, keep at it and keep showing them and modeling that for them. And hopefully, as their dexterity increases, that they'll that they'll kind of catch they'll catch on. But yeah, if you can brush the teeth for the children, that's that's awesome. And then it looks like another follow up to that same sort of brushing themed question here is: How often should you change your toothbrush? So they say every three to four months or after you've had a cold or been sick. Or if the bristles have worn down, that's another sign that you need to um, change your toothbrush. If you drop it in the toilet, change your toothbrush. If um, somebody else uses it by mistake, I would change my toothbrush. But 
Um, so three, three to six, you see, I see different um, advice out there on that. You know, toothbrushes are kind of expensive, so not everybody can change them out every three months. So, um, but definitely after you've been sick. Okay, great. And then how much time should you spend while brushing your teeth? So two minutes is the recommended time. So with little ones, we like to say, you know, sing a song while, they're, while you're brushing their teeth or um, use a timer is another good way to do that. But it takes about two minutes to get every tooth clean. And I think a lot of times when they say two minutes that people get a little impatient. So they'll maybe brush for a minute and a half and that's, that's good too. But two minutes is the time frame. Okay, great. Um, Another question we have here is, are parents advised about inhalers damaging teeth? Say it again, Sarah. I'm sorry. Are parents advised about inhalers damaging teeth? Oh, right, because inhalers will dry out the mouth, and that does two things. It dries out the mouth, and that decreases the saliva, and that makes the mouth more susceptible to the acid. But also, kids get really thirsty. And so when they're thirsty, they ask for more to drink, and then oftentimes they're just given sugary juices or liquids, and, and so that also defeats the purpose. How, I don't think that it's common for the pharmacist or anyone to say, um, you know, this inhaler, this is what happens, they're going to dry out. But no, I think that's something we have to keep educating on. Okay, and it looks like we have um, a few questions here about sanitizing toothbrushes, so I'll try and combine them all into one. Okay. Um, does alcohol kill germs on toothbrushes, and how good are toothbrush sanitizers, and would placing a toothbrush in the dishwasher keep it sanitized? Okay, alcohol and toothbrush, I don't think that I would do that. It probably does kill some germs, but I would not want I don't think that I could rinse it enough to get that alcohol taste or smell off of there. And that could cause stomach aches if, you know, you ingest that. Tooth sanitizers, you know, there's research out there that they do work and they don't work. Um, it could be just a money maker, but um, it's kind of iffy on the research on the sanitizers. I have heard of people putting their toothbrushes in the dishwasher. I have never done that, but I would imagine that that water gets hot enough that would kill germs, so I suppose that would be a way to do it. Yeah, but I've never done it myself. Okay. Um, is an electric toothbrush better than a do-it-yourself toothbrush, and is it okay to use an electronic toothbrush for a five-year-old? Yes and yes. So there's been a, a lot of research actually on the effectiveness of using an electric toothbrush versus a manual toothbrush. And in the studies that I've read, the electric toothbrushes seem to do better. But that, and especially with kids, and it's fine for kids, and there's great ones out there with all kind of cartoon characters, and that, and that alone can make the child happy to brush, but also they kind of get a kick out of brushing with the electric toothbrush, so that also can make a child brush even better. So the research does show that electric toothbrushes are better and they're fine for children to use. Great. Um, one of the questions we have here is, what are your feelings on Oragel or other pain relief teething remedies for teething pain? Yeah, I don't like um, to use Oragel for um, kids for teething pain. I think better to use the, the um, cold cloth or the, you know, a cold teething ring and let them chew on that. That's a little bit better. But the Oragel and those type of wipe-on ointments can sometimes irritate the gum tissue and cause different problems. So I don't recommend them. Okay. Another question we have here is, how often should children see a dentist after the initial first visit at one year old? So to go in at one or within six months of the first tooth erupting, and then more than likely they're put on an every six months schedule, just like the rest of the family. Every six months, 
um, they, the dentist or the hygienist will do a check, and you know if there's a couple teeth, they'll put the the little uh, trophy angle on it to clean the teeth. Um, it's a lot easier, of course, than when you go in as an adult. But um, just getting the child used to this is what we do every six months, this is what we do as a family, we take care of our teeth, and that it's a normal part of how we interact, I think is really important. And also I want to just say a note about um, some parents who, and I've noted, and I said this earlier on, is they have their own fears, and so they're afraid for their children to have that same pain that they experience. And so often parents will tell the child, oh, don't be, there's nothing to be afraid of and, and don't be worried. But just saying those words to a child, as most of you know, is going to cause fear. Because they weren't thinking that they were going to be afraid until the mother said, don't be afraid. So I often tell parents to, um, you know, just say, oh, we're going to go to the dentist, make it as natural and normal as possible. And then, you know, they usually have such a good time. You know, they get to play with the chair, they get some attention from the the dentist and they get to have the polisher and fluoride and then they get hopefully a prize and a toothbrush at the end too. Okay, great. Um, a couple other questions here. Uh, we have two that are similar so I'll combine these. This says, how do you feel about mouth rinses that dye the teeth or what about teething tablets? I'm not really familiar with teething tablets. Um, you know, I say go more natural, again, still with the cold cloth or the, um, the really cold teething ring. Um, but uh, mouth rinses, mouth, you know, definitely, I would, unless it's a fluoride rinse, and your dentist has suggested that hey, you take, have your mouth do a fluoride rinse, and that's one thing. But in terms of uh, regular mouthwash, like a Listerine type of thing, for adults, I certainly wouldn't give to children. It's really um, very strong. Um, even for adults, you know, if you're brushing and flossing and taking good care of your teeth and gums, then you don't really need to have a mouth wash. Okay. Um, here's a little bit of a longer question. It says, I've heard that if the mom is cavity prone and the dad isn't, the child could be cavity prone. If that is the case, should the dad place his own saliva on the infant's gums to help get rid of the mom's cavity germs? I don't know that that process would work. I mean, you would. I think the best thing to do if the child is cavity prone is to just keep the mouth as clean as possible, brushing at least twice a day with a fluoride toothpaste, going into the dentist, decreasing the sugar, increasing the healthy fruits and vegetables. But um, I think that would probably a better, be a better way to go about it. Okay, great. Uh, we have a couple of questions here regarding printed information to hand out to parents. And I just want to remind everyone that tonight's webinar is recorded, so if you do want to let uh, parents know about tonight's webinar, they can always come back and reference our webinar, but we don't have anything that you are able to print off unless you wanted to print tonight's webinar. There may be resources on that page that Deidre had mentioned, but we don't have any specific handouts for you to print tonight. Um, another couple questions that we have here. Um, are baking soda toothpaste products okay for children to use? I wouldn't use the baking soda on children. I would. I only recommend that for adults. You know, there's um, some people like to use um, baking soda as a teeth whitener, and um, and that's fine. But I wouldn't use it with children. I think it's too harsh. And really, children shouldn't have to worry about teeth whitening. It's not like they're having coffee, hopefully, or. Um, wine or anything that will stain their teeth. So I would would not use it for children. Um, one of the questions here says, would boiling the toothbrushes be an acceptable way to clean them? I think you could probably sterilize toothbrushes that way and then just really clean the, the pot out afterwards. But I, I mean, ideally, I'm, that technically would work, yeah. Great. This question says, my daughter is three years old and will not use toothpaste that is age appropriate. She still uses infant toothpaste. Is this harming her teeth? No, that's fine. As long as she's using toothpaste, I think that's fine. It's, it's 
taste preferences. Like I said, I'm sure there's adults out there who like the bubblegum flavor toothpaste and use it. So yeah, that's no harm at all. Uh, this question is asking about cough drops, and it says, should you brush your teeth after each one? Well, yeah, because that's probably increasing the acid attack, so there's sugar in cough drops, so, you know, it's that great cherry flavor, and so, yeah, it's doing the same thing. You're increasing that acid attack for 20 minutes after you have, after you have one. You could do the rinse again, you know, like I suggested earlier, just put some water in your mouth and swish it around, and that will help. Um, neutralize that acid and, and you can spit that out and that will get some of the sugar off your teeth. It's a good question. I haven't had that one before. <laughs> it's good to, good to know. Yep. Um, one of the questions we have here is, my dentist told me that my son would need a sedation process to get his cavity out. Is, a sedation, is sedation a normal procedure on a three-year-old? Yeah, unfortunately when children have a lot of decay or need a lot of work done in their mouth, you know, it's unfortunate that they get to that point, and that's why we try to emphasize being preventative in nature, going to the dentist early before it gets to that situation. But there are plenty of cases where kids have to be hospitalized and under general anesthesia to get a bunch of work done all at once. And to some respect, it's a little bit kinder to the kid instead of going back a whole bunch of different times for all of this dental care and getting it all done at once. But um, yeah, that's, it's not unheard of for sure. Okay, great. Um, if we have any more questions, please feel free to type those into the box over on the side of your screen. Um, we'll give everyone just a few more minutes to send those in. We have a few questions coming in right now. Okay. Uh, this question says, what about cough syrup that is supposed to coat the throat to prevent coughs? If you have the child rinse the mouth, doesn't that also rinse the medicine too? If you rinse, yeah, it might actually. So you have to be aware of that. So take the cough syrup and maybe just do, um, just rinse the front teeth. You know, if you can do some kind of like easy rinse and something that's not disturbing it. Or you can wait a little while after and just get some relief and then realize that, hey, we got to get that sugar off of your teeth that we just coated it. Okay, great. And then this question here says, have parents been notified that it is now best to have children see a dentist earlier than a year old? Um, well, we try to start, yeah, with the first birthday. So we're trying to get the word out. So there's a lot of different states that have really, um, a lot of the oral health programs have been really putting out that message. And we talk about it a lot more. Um, it hasn't been for maybe the past five years that we've even started talking about that. So when a lot of us were kids, you know, maybe we didn't go to the dentist until we were four or five. But now that we're still seeing so much decay, um, a lot of the public health programs are really focusing on the age one dental home. So those messages are just starting to get out now and hopefully we're reaching the parents. We're trying to talk about it as much as possible and we're having to train a lot of, we're having to teach a lot of the dentists who aren't, you know, there's still dentists out there who won't see kids who are really young and we still have pediatricians that recommend children don't go to the dentist until they're four or five. So we're really starting to do a big education campaign to teach everyone that age one uh, dental home is the way to go. Okay, then we'll just answer a few more questions here. We want to be respectful of everyone's time and end our webinar after the hour mark. But uh, one of the questions we have is, do you have any resources for dental care assistance for parents that don't have insurance? Um, uh, yeah, so there are so one good place to start is school-based health centers. School-based health centers hopefully will offer some sort of dental component to, um, to their services, even if it's just the physician doing a quick assessment and maybe putting on fluoride varnish. But hopefully they, have, they know what's in the community and know where to go for sliding scale or free care. But there's a couple there's a couple different programs, and usually in bigger cities and other communities too, but you just 
really have to start asking around where the sliding scales are because dental care is expensive and even when you have insurance there's co-pays and out-of-pocket expenses but just keep asking and finding out what's in your community and um, ask your physicians and ask your people at the schools and um, just keep asking and talking about it and people hopefully will can refer you someplace. Okay, great. Uh, another question we have here is, my pediatrician told me that my child didn't have to see a dentist until her third birthday. How far behind will she be? So yeah, that's what I was got to a little bit earlier, that some of the physicians and even dentists aren't even on board with the age one dental. So even with physicians, the American Academy of Physicians, um, pediatric physicians, even on their website, they have an oral health tab that teaches medical providers and um, how to, that the importance of going to a dentist at age one and how important the care is. But it's just, again, a matter of educating and getting the word out there. But yeah, it, it happens. I mean, you can certainly take your child earlier, even though that's what your physician said. I mean, now you know how important the age one is. But um, hopefully, if she's already three and hasn't been to the dentist, I'd get her right away and make sure that there aren't any problems. Okay, great. And I know that we have a couple of questions in here regarding certificates. So right now I'm going to post my email address up here. And if you would like a certificate of participation for tonight's webinar, um, please just send me an email and do understand that. It will probably take me up to a week to get those certificates out, but I will send them out to you if you request one. Um, let me just pull this up right here. All right, so here's my contact information. If you do have any questions that we were unable to get to tonight, please feel free to email me, and I can keep in touch with Deidre and let her know um, and try and get those answers for you. Also, if you'd like a certificate, as I said, please send me an email. Um, but I do want to thank everyone for participating in tonight's webinar. We had a lot of really great questions, and I really appreciate everyone bringing those great questions to our uh, presentation tonight. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me, and I hope that you'll be able to join us on our next webinar. So I just want to say thank you and have a great night.